Okay, what key is it in? It was in G. <laughs> How do I get back to this? If I take it down, I want to play with it. Uh, there's probably like a stupid history over there. Yeah, there's still the Pac Man one that you can find. Yeah. Oh, what? Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to be playing something? Yeah. Oh. oh, no, 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 no. I want to go back. <laughs> I want to do it by own. No, no. All right. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, Ms. Cavendish is thinking about becoming a physics major, and what are you now instead? Okay. All right, so she's visiting the class, and, and uh, so I'm going to talk to her, hopefully, in my office sometime, give her some idea about what this class is about. Uh, she's kind of jumping in late in the year here to, to get an idea of, you know, this is a, not one of the first classes we've had, so there's a lot of stuff. Um, but So hopefully I'll see her in the fall in this class. Uh, let's see. So after spring break, there's Holy Week. After that is, um, how about the 31st? The weather's so great. March 31st, let's go have pizza. How about? And then the next week, the seventh, we'll we'll do a recitation, or maybe we'll swap it. We'll do the recitation and the pizza. I don't know which, but anyway. Where are we gonna go? Same place, Mellow Mushroom. Oh, that's that's a good place. What? It's close. It's that can't close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow! They never told me. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> That's too for a yeah. and, well, and it was, it, they had a nice porch out, outside. We could sit outside and eat in this beautiful weather. I think they had a new property that they're trying to build on. But they closed before yeah. they opened up the new? Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, I guess I'll have to, I'll have to figure that one out. I'll take suggestions, you know, we'll, we'll figure that one out. Okay, but anyway, put those, put those dates on your calendar, the 31st. Ms. Cavendish, you're welcome to join us uh, on the 31st for pizza. And then this, or the seventh of April. I'm not sure which it'll be. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, some videos here I want to show you. Uh, this this is a. I think it's a combination of simulation and some data. The Earth's magnetic field under the influence of the solar wind, and uh, so there's. You can see the magnetic field lines. The sun is here over to the left. The radiation and particles and stuff are driving, altering the magnetic field. And uh, it even looks like a big piece of it, <laughs> it detaches and goes off. So the charged particles, of course, flowing around through all of this. Obviously, a very dynamical system. Okay, let's see here. Uh, demonstration. Oh, okay. Let's switch it on and see what it Through this coil of thick wire, we're about to pass a huge alternating electric current. So we haven't talked much about AC. Let me let's talk about AC. Of course, remember the induction that it occurs if something is changing, if you're moving the secondary or uh, towards the primary, or the primary towards the secondary, or changing the current in the primary. Uh, we've talked about those, but suppose we keep the we change the current in the primary by making it an alternating current so that it's just a sine wave. So there's a constant change in a sense. You know, it's, it's oscillating frequently. So we hear this noise. What's that noise? Is it vibration of the thing? So it's vibration at the two times the frequency of the sine wave. Whoa! Whoa! That's an aluminum. Good sound effects. That's just an aluminum plate. <laughs> How does it do that? To find out, come to the place where it all started, the Royal Institution in London. This is the key to Faraday's magnetic lab. Locked door. From the 18th century, Bronze became a story, which is why it survived, and it survived intact. All the joinery, starvation magnets, uh, exactly the same as Faraday's uh, 
So that's your exact way of describing it. That's what I was getting. In Faraday's time, it was known that electric current creates a magnetic field, but it remained an open question whether the reverse is possible if a magnetic field could generate electric current. Faraday answered this question with his most famous apparatus. Faraday's electromagnetic induction ring, which is this. In August 1831, Faraday wrapped two coils of insulated wire around this iron ring. So 1831, which is not the amount of the little bit of power that shot off that they used to this wire, you had to insulate the wire as you went, so as you pushed it through the wire, it got the ring and had to insulate it, it took 10 working days, which was useless at the time. But the investment paid off. When Faraday connected a battery to one of the coils, he saw a brief pulse of current in the other coil. And when he disconnected the battery, he saw a pulse of current in the other direction. He realized that current was induced in the second coil only when the magnetic field through it was changing. And if they hadn't been wrapped on the same ring, Faraday may have noticed that the two coils repel each other when the current is induced. And that's due to the interaction of their magnetic field. Which brings us back to this. Through the bottom coil, we are passing we a huge explain a little differently, right? 800 yeah. amps, which alternates in direction 900 times per second. This ensures there will always be a change in magnetic field above the coil. Instead of the second coil, we're using the aluminum plate, but the principle is the same. The changing magnetic field induces currents in the plate that create an opposing magnetic field, so it levitates. Okay, so their explanation is, needs to be modified, right? We've learned the, really the correct way of explaining it, but I think it's pretty neat to see Faraday's lab like that. He was asked when he announced his discovery, uh, the, the story goes, of what use is magnetic induction? And his answer was, what use is a newborn babe? Right? We don't discover these things. We don't have babies because they're useful, right? <laughs> we have babies because we're people, and, and we're, we discover things like this because it's nature, and, and, and we're made to know. So uh, let's see. He's going to go on to show here. I think that that, that plate gets hot. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. This is worth seeing. Maybe I shouldn't shut it off yet. It can also make light bulbs glow. And just as current in the plate <laughs> heats it up, the induced current in the plate dissipates its energy as heat. That's the resisted heating. So, do you know about Tesla? Have you read about Tesla? Of course, he was involved in a lot of discoveries of, of electricity and magnetism. A kind of a strange guy, he worked on his own a lot, had a lot of peculiar habits that made it difficult for other people to get to know him very well. Um, had a lot of strange habits at the dinner table. He would want to rearrange stuff and polishing plates and stuff constantly, and didn't like women to wear perfume. So, they, he was eating out, somebody had perfume next to him, he would get really upset. You know strange quirks. Anyway, he had a lab where he had all kinds of things like lights that would wireless lighting. He could carry the lights around because there was a, an inductive field inside the lab, right, which has an effect on you. And Mark Twain met the guy and wrote about his visit to Tesla's lab in New York City and uh, got very excited about it. Tesla had him holding all these things and standing in this inductive field. And then Twain was having a lot of fun and Tesla kept saying, uh, okay, we better turn this off though. And, and he said, no, this is too much fun. I want to keep doing this. He said, no, you'll want to turn it off. It's, it's, it's not going to really harm you, but you're going to want to turn it off. And, and Twain kept fiddling with it, didn't, didn't turn it off. And suddenly he had to go to the bathroom really bad. <laughs> and that was, that was what Tesla was trying to warn him. Apparently, that can, that is a laxative effect. So anyway, it's interesting. You should look up Twain's visit to uh, Tesla's lab. It's pretty cool. Uh, this, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how this works. Okay, he's playing the guitar. I don't know why the, why we're not getting any sound there. It's driving the string. I don't know if 
it's an inductive coupling or or capacitive coupling. I'm not sure. His explanation is in, it's inductive, so I guess. screen. So it's, it's not plastic. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, let's go on to uh, number 16 on the homework. Okay, so we, we have this uh, problem of having a wire that's carrying current and then we have a secondary, make it a square shaped secondary, makes it easier to analyze. And the, the uh, challenge here is to use the Lorentz force present on the virtual parts inside of the secondary. We're going to push the secondary towards the primary, and then we're going to use the Lorentz force to calculate the EMF induced in this. So the force, remember, on, on a charge, the Lorentz force looks like this. And the, and the magnetic field, I think I have a sign error. If it's set up like this, then I have a sign error, because the, which, which, which is the direction of the magnetic field here in this case? If it's coming from, anyway, on the right side of the, the magnetic field would be into the page. Maybe maybe I had, was thinking on the other side. Maybe the wire is on the other side. Anyway, so uh, V cross B then produces a force. Let's see. V cross B is going to produce a force in the downward direction, right? Uh, over on this side, however, what is, what's the direction of the force? How about here? Of course, it's downward. That's not going to drive current through the loop. And down here, it's, it's downward. So the, the force is downward. Why does it produce any net current? Then? Seems like we've got two competing things. Mr. McKenna. Because the strength of the B field decreases over the distance. Exactly. The, remember, the B field is diminishing like one, like one over the distance. And, and that's where I think I have a sign error here. This, the way I have it drawn here, that should be into the board like that. It should be negative. So it diminishes like one over the distance. So this, this closer piece has a stronger force on its parts. The parts on the farther segment are, are less. And so we, get a, we have to have a balancing. And so we need to calculate the work done charge all the way around the circuit. Okay, so what we need to do is to calculate the force uh, dot dl, that is the network done in moving a charge around the circuit, we need to see that that's going to be actually uh, not zero, right? That there's a net force on there. Okay, so we have, uh, then we, we can break this up into, into the four legs, right? So we have a leg one, leg two, and so forth. And the, uh, so if I'm going to label them one, two, three, and four. Two and four uh, do no work because the force is perpendicular to the direction of motion, so there's no work done on those. And then we can calculate the, the uh, work done on leg three and leg four. And of course, the, the magnetic field at this distance, let's call this X, and then the, um, the uh, side, the uh, side of the square the length of the side is A, then we're going to have clearly a difference between uh, these because one is farther away than the other one, right? Okay, so, um, and then you can, you can calculate then the EMF uh, by calculating uh, uh, the force in each direction. Let's see, F dy, integral of F dy, F is constant along that, so that's just F A along leg one, and the same thing on leg three. Uh, but in one case, the, the displacement is in the direction of the force. In the other case, it's against the displacement, is against the force. Okay, so there's a difference. Okay, and so you can calculate then the EMF. Be careful about your units here. I calculated it in SI in the solution here, uh, just because I'm, I'm more used to calculating things uh, if I want to compare like volts and things like that. So SI is a more common system of units. Any questions about that?
Okay, now let's see, On uh, for your homework for Friday, you're going to go back to the PFRM, PFR mechanics, and you're going, going to look at the analog. There's actually a section in the simple harmonic oscillator chapter. You read it last semester, but you didn't know about LRC circuits, and so it might have gone by not quite understanding what was going on. So you're going to go back and read that section again. You're going to study the analogy between uh, the, the electrical and mechanical analogs here. And so he draws an LRC circuit like this with, and we're going to insert a battery here, an AC battery, and that's the signal for that is that wavy line. So there's an AC voltage source, and uh, we have the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor all in, in series like that with the AC battery. And that's going to, uh, so mathematically, remember we wrote down the equation of motion for the LRC circuit here in terms of the, uh, the charge on the capacitor. Without the battery, this will be zero. Uh, or with a, with a DC battery, of course, there's a constant term on the right-hand side. Now we have a, an applied voltage, which depends on time. And in fact, we'll say that this goes like some driving voltage times cosine omega t. So it's an AC driving force on this. Now this mechanically, remember, looks a lot like Uh, mathematically, it looks analogous to the problem that we did, we looked at before when we did the simple harmonic oscillator. We have a damped, driven harmonic oscillator. So the restoring force is still Hooke's law. It's still proportional to the displacement, but there's a drive, uh, a damping term, and then of course there's the mass, and then there's the driver. In this case. An, a, an AC driver. Well, mathematically it's very similar, which of course comes from the analogical generality of physical systems, because what is the base property of all physical things? Quantity, and in particular we study extension. Right? So that's why you keep, these things keep cropping up, is that fundamentally extension is at the base of all these things. Okay, so, you, but you can see here, ah, okay, now this, he actually displays this, he, he takes the time derivative of this, so he, if we were to uh, take the time derivative in the uh, mechanics book, he actually writes it like this and, and looks in terms of the current, right? Uh, Q dot is the current, so he actually writes the equation in terms of the current. No, might look funny, of course, if you see that. And that's just would be taking the time derivative of the left-hand side. But uh, I think it's the an analogy is a little clearer if you write it in terms of charge. I think. Okay, so now we studied. You might remember the response of a damped driven oscillator to an AC driver, and uh, we said that there's two components to that. There's the amplitude of of the motion. Uh, which depends on the driving frequency, and there was a resonance like this. And this resonant frequency depends on the, 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 the constants involved, the mass, the, the damping, and the, and the spring constant. That resonant frequency depends on those. And so you f we could find that that resonant frequency, then you could, the driving frequency is could be out of tune, could be off of the resonance, and so the the, the response uh, could be weak if you're out here or out here. If the frequency is too low or too high, you don't get much resonance, you don't get much motion out of the oscillator. Whereas if you tune the frequency, hit that resonance, you got the maximum amplitude of response. <coughs> and the other other factor was the uh, phase shift, which uh, uh, goes remember correctly, it looks like that. Uh, so that the, the motion is in phase, if the frequency is low, the motion is in phase with the driver. As you go through the resonance and have a high frequency, then, then it's out of sync, exactly out of phase with the driver, the response is, okay? So we studied that in the, in the context of the, of the damped 
proven simple harmonic oscillator. But the same analysis mathematically would apply to this. So we can study the LRC circuit and look at the monitor the charge on the capacitor, drive this whole simple LRC circuit with an AC driver. And uh, then you, so you're going to figure out, okay, what does that mean in terms of this circuit? What does it look like? That's your homework for Friday. Questions? Okay, obviously you can get much more complicated with these things. We're considering just really simple circuits. <coughs> you can get more elaborate ha because of the induction coupled one circuit to another. You could have crosstalk between separate circuits and that could be, so you can get really interesting connections between them. Um, there was something I was going to say about Oh well, it went by. All right. I'll think of it later, no doubt. <clears throat> okay, now let's go back. There's there's something we need to consider here. Maxwell's third equation, you remember what that is from chapter two, the electrostatics condition. In the electrostatics condition, what is Maxwell's third equation? This one? Good. Very good, Miss Wayne. The curl of E is zero. What does that mean physically? Yeah, it never circulates in a closed path. It won't, there won't be any circulation around a closed path. It only diverges from the charge that generates that in the plana. Okay, so, but now, and remember, we found that this was, this was electrostatic. That's where we left the curl of E when we were dealing with electrostatics, but now we've got something new here. Remember back in the electrostatic condition we said we could determine a, an electrostatic potential such as the gradient of, the, of phi, or the negative gradient of phi is the electric field, and if we substitute that into Maxwell's third equation, right, we get the curl of a gradient. But you did a homework where you showed a vector identity, the curl of the gradient of any function is what? Zero, yeah, which is consistent with Maxwell's third equation, right? And in fact, that's part of the reasoning. That's part of the reason why you can write the, there is an electrostatic potential related to the electric field this way because the curl of E is zero. Okay, but now we've done something. Remember Maxwell's trick here. We're relaxing the electrostatic condition. We're relaxing some of the conditions specifically. What we're relaxing is actually magnetostatics, right? So we're starting to mix these things in funny ways. And Maxwell, because he's relaxing the magnetostatic condition, he leads us now into modifying the E field, what he calls the E field, which is now actually a combination of both electric and magnetic. So he's adding this term. And he, he gets away with doing it. He wants to have a compact mathematical system. He gets away with doing it because the effect of A dot is the same as the effect of grad phi. They're not the same cause, but they're the same effect. And if he's focusing on effects, he can lump them in together. Uh, so he's analogically extending this E field uh, that will include now electric and magnetic. Okay, but now let's go take the curl of this. Because we said before that the electric field had no curl. All right, so that first term there is it's still zero, right? That's zero for all phi. It's a, that's a vector. That's an identity, a vector identity. That second term, okay, we have the curl of the time derivative of a. Well, remember, partial derivatives, mixed partial derivatives, the order doesn't matter. We did that in we did that before. We saw that the partial derivative with respect to x, partial derivative with respect to y, of some function of x and y is the same as taking the partial derivatives in the reverse order. And that's true also if one of them is time. So we can rewrite this as the time derivative of the curl of A. And what is the curl of A? B. See, we suddenly got magnetic in here. <laughs> We're now mixing, and that's because of 
Maxwell's choice here. Maybe we should call it choice with a capital C, Maxwell's choice. It's not coffee, but it is uh, a decision here to incorporate two different causes into the same symbol. So now Maxwell's third equation is, has to be modified. Where before, if we had, remember before in magnetostatics we had the primary can't move and they can't change current. And so the, the magnetic field doesn't change and so the magnetic field would be constant so its time derivative is zero. So now because we allowed the current to change or allowed the primary to move, then we have to account, for, then, then we get a changing magnetic field, okay? Now, now notice this though, this really isn't the problem here, the, the difficulty that people have with this, is that this is not really anything. He hasn't really done anything uh, physical. And, and to demonstrate that, remember, let's go back, that we have a piece of here, we have the, the piece which is the, um, let's just look at the part that survives the curl. We have a term in the electric field which is the time derivative of A. And then we have a piece here, we have the time derivative of the curl of A. That's just a mathematical identity. There's no physical content in this equation. And this is really going to mess people up. Because you'll find that in a lot of texts on electrodynamics, they're actually saying here a changing B and they did it in the they did it here. You heard it on the video. A changing B causes a curling E, causes a current. Right? Not. <laughs> it's not true. And you heard him say it on there. And that's why I tried to. I almost wanted to cut him off because they were. You, you, you'll hear this other places. It's a it's a false conclusion to say. I'm going to write it here, but I'm going to cross it off. Don't say this. Changing B causes. Curling E, not, and that's, and the problem here is looking at equations and thinking that they always contain causal content. So if I say the number of apples equals the number of oranges, what does that say? Well, it doesn't say anything really about causal connection. It doesn't mean that these apples cause the oranges or the oranges cause the apples, right? It's just the number happens to be the same. In fact, in this case, what you're going, what you see here, in this particular case, it's just a mathematical identity, because of what how he defined in his choice of lumping A into this electric field, and that's all, the only physical content in this. I mean, there isn't any physical content. Is what I'm saying, yeah, beyond what what we had before. It's a trick. It's a, it's it's something that that really will confuse a lot of people. There's another thing we're going to find in the next chapter where Maxwell does another thing in order to simplify the equations. And it also ends up with a very misleading, uh, uh, confusing part, potentially misleading and potentially confusing. Okay, now, I'm not saying that Maxwell's equations are useless. I'm just saying that the causal structure of electrodynamics is not made clear by Maxwell's equations. And, and what, what happens in in this is that people will tend to look at the equations and then try to construct a narrative that goes along with how you calculate things. And in that narrative they will say this causes that. But they've not actually thought about it carefully. And they're just looking at the mathematics and trying to explain how things get calculated. Not in the true real physical connection. Okay, and we'll find the same thing happening in the next chapter. There's another thing that's just like this in Maxwell's equation. So the problem is because of these choices that Maxwell makes to simplify the mathematics, he's losing some of the physical clarity that we could have. Okay, and, and but now you might think, wow, this is going to get, why are we doing this then? Why don't we just rewrite Maxwell's equations or something? But there's a way out. It's very simple. And that is look at phi and A. If you stick with phi and A, life is simple. The causal connection is, is retained in phi and A. So if you do the problems, do the work, and think about things in terms of phi and A, you won't get confused. And remember, what causes phi and what causes A? Okay, what causes phi? The phi field. The charge to mass of phi. 
Charged mass of body. What causes an aphid? Impetus activated charge mass of body. Right, charge mass of bodies with impetus. And then the cause and effect is really simple. You can you can work it all out. There's no confusion. So and and we'll we'll come back and study that in chapter uh, six. We'll study this more in chapter six. How to use phi and a, and uh, to really get unconfused. In other words, try to stay un stay unconfused, right? And um, uh, but uh, but it's very important to recognize that equations like this. Uh, do not contain uh, causal content. Not all equations have causal connections. Okay, another way of looking at this, in this case, it's, uh, there's another one where we're going to have the curl of B. And the curl of B has an E dot term, a time derivative of E in it, an equation, in addition to something else. The thing to remember here is not that changing B causes curling E or that changing E causes curling B, as you'll see in the next equation. Instead, think about it this way. E and B are generated by the same sources, and they're correlated with each other. This is simply a correlation. And so it's not a causal connection, uh, in spite of what you'll find in other textbooks. Right? Um, and this is, this is when I saw this and the first time I read through this book, it was just like, like the clouds lifted. I mean, it really has heavified the subject of E&M. This really, E&M is a heavily mathematical subject. You've gotten the idea of that, right? And it's easy to get lost in the trees. And, and, and that's why there are these narratives about how things are calculated. How do you calculate things? But instead, if you push, as Dr. Rizzi does, the cause and effect, the causal connections, it will make so much more sense when you're done. And you won't get lost in the trees so much. It's still, you still get to do the math, but it's just you won't get lost doing the math. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Questions? So at the end of chapter four, right, what are, the, what are Maxwell's equations? At the end of chapter four, Uh, now remember, what are, what are the conditions? We still have some conditions. In fact, really only one remaining condition, well, two, one, one remaining condition on the current. The current still can't do something. Build up. Say again? Build up. Yeah, that's right. The charge can't build up, yeah. right? Current can't diverge or converge. So divergence of J still must be zero. That's still the case. We're going to relax that in the next chapter. The very next chapter gets rid of that condition, but we still have this, which means that rho dot is zero. Charge cannot build up. Current could build up, right? That's not, not correct to say that current can build up, because you could change the current. So current can change, so current could build up. You could say it that way, but what can't build up is it can't, the, term, the current can't terminate and then have charge building up on a capacitor plate, for example. So we did capacitors in chapter two, but we really weren't quite ready for them yet. So we'll be doing capacitor, the proper treatment of the capacitor charging in the next chapter. Okay, given that, here are Maxwell's equations now. We have Maxwell's four equations. We have <coughs> phi and a, right? That, and uh, we could have, we could write. I, sh I guess I should complete this. The, the, the Lorentz force. In terms of a and phi, or in terms of. <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> and review just a little bit more here. Let's go back to phi and A. Remember, if we have a row, if we have a charge distribution, we can find phi. 
and that's by integrating over the contributions from each little piece of charge over the distance from where you want to know phi. And if we have a current distribution, we can find A. And this includes, okay, yeah, we should be a little careful here. Um, we can calculate A. But this is in the in, this is in the case of the instantaneous propagation. Propo, propagation. There we go. <clears throat> We're not taking into account the time delay. If I change rho at some place phi somewhere else infinitely far away changes instantaneously, right? That's the, that's the approximation that we're making here. And we'll, we'll fix that in, the, in two chapters coming. We'll fix this problem with the instantaneous propagation. But you've done two examples of this. You've done one dimensional example of a line charge and also a wire carrying current. You calculated phi and A by doing a one dimensional integral. Uh, so you've had an instance of this, okay? And this is where the causal connection is maintained, right? Rho causes phi, J causes A. And that's, that's the, the real simplicity. And if you track phi and A, you'll never get confused about that. So we're going to, this is not yet finished because it's, like I said, it's instantaneous propagation. It doesn't take into account the fact that there's a finite speed of propagation, speed of light. But that's so fast, uh, you know, working here on the table, I don't have to worry about that, right? So I could understand a lot of tabletop experiments just by using this. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of a, an overview of where we are then, where we're leaving, where we've left off here at the end of chapter four. We have that the current cannot diverge, which means the charge density is a constant. And, uh, but, but the current could change, and which could in include moving the primary, for example. Uh, and then we have Maxwell's four equations, and then the Lorentz force law, and then the other piece, which is uh, very helpful, is that you can actually construct phi and A if you know the sources. Rho is a source for phi, J is a source of A, that makes it really simple. And then from phi and A, you could determine E and B if you want to know what those are. Okay, so now in preparation for getting us into the next chapter, <clears throat> there's no homework over spring break, so you don't have any good time to review, get caught up, if you have some confusion, you know, try to fix that for yourself. But I'm not gonna, otherwise no homework over spring break. But I'm going to start talking now about the next chapter. We'll start studying chapter five after spring break. I'm going to start working on that now. And uh, the beginning of that is to go back to the Helmholtz theorem. Remember, the Helmholtz theorem said that any vector field can be decomposed into two parts, into uh, a part that has no curl, a superposition of a, a part that has no curl and a part that has no divergence. Now, say decompose, it's not physically decompose. Right? There is no physical separation of fields. For example, we could do this decomposition of the charge of the current density. But it's not a physical decomposition, it's a mathematical separation. Keep that in mind. And, I'm, and we're going to use these subscripts here. D, J sub D, is the part that has no curl. It may diverge, but it might actually have no divergence. It's also possible. But you know that it has no curl. So we're going to call it D. <laughs> should be called not C, but in the book it's called D. 
and j sub c has no divergence. It maybe should be called no d, j no d and j no c, but we call it j d and j c. Okay, now in the magnetostatics up to now, remember what is our condition here? We're saying one of these terms is zero. JD is zero. It has no diverging part and only a curling part. So, so far, up till now, we have considered JD to be zero, no curling part, a, a no, uh, no curling no diverging part, <laughs> right? This is, see, I'm getting confused myself. No diverging part. This is all that's left. It's the part that doesn't diverge, right? So that when we take the divergence of J, we just get the divergence of the curling part, but that has no divergence, right? JC has no divergence, so that's always zero. Okay, let's, let's, and we could do a similar kind of decomposition. And remember, this decomposition is not a physical decomposition. It's, it's merely a mathematical sorting of the characteristics of vector fields. Let's look at the magnetic field up to now. Can we say about these pieces? One of these pieces has no, has no divergence, right? So up to now, and in fact, not just up to now, that will always be the case. Not just up to now, but always. D never has a diverging part because there are no magnetic monopoles. There's no nothing that would cause a diverging D field. So that's always zero. We will only have a curling part of D. How about the electric field? Well, now we've got something that we've got two pieces. We have both, a diverging part and a curling part. Because we put into the E field, I should call it the E field, we put into the E field a magnetic effect, a magnetic cause, the A dot. Okay? So Let's re remember what we can write this minus grad phi minus 1 over C dA dt. And let's take the curl and divergence of this to see what, what it does. So if I take the divergence of this, okay. Yeah. Um, we haven't, we haven't discussed this, but actually A must diverge, must have no divergence. Divergence of A is zero. In the, in the situation that we have now, the magnetostatics case, A cannot have any divergence because the current has no divergence. If we come back to this equation here, this actually can be used to demonstrate that if, if J has no divergence, then so does A. Okay, so this would be zero. And the divergence of E is related to the phi. If we take the curl of E by that vector identity, that's always zero. And so the curling part of E is related to the curling part of A. Okay, so you can see they're starting to sort out here that we can connect the diverging and curling parts of these fields with each other. So, in other words, this piece, the grad phi, is the part of E that diverges, and this part is the part of E that curls. That's the curling part. Okay. So let's just briefly go back over this again, because this is going to, you need, really need to kind of sort this out in your mind. It'll really make the next chapter much simpler if you go through this and study this in some detail. Every vector field 
well-behaved vector field can be decomposed into two parts, a part that doesn't curl and a part that doesn't diverge. And up to now, we've considered currents that only curl, that don't have any divergence. And so that JD can be zero, is, is zero, so far. It will change in the next chapter, but so far we've always wanted just circulating currents. No capacitor plates or anything. Magnetic fields can be decomposed. And we say decomposed is mathematical here, not physical. We can decompose the mathemat the mathemat the B field into two pieces, and we find, in fact, it never diverges. So we can just always throw that part away. And remember, that comes from the curl of A. So BC comes from the curl of A. Right? The curling part of B comes from the curl of A. Now the um, electric field can be decomposed, and you can see that the, the part that doesn't curl and the part that doesn't diverge, which are the diverging and curling parts, we call them, are related to the grad phi and the A dot pieces. Okay, so that kind of sinks in with what we've been doing with the scalar and vector potential. Okay, so this this will take some practice and re and reading and studying. You know, this, there are a lot of because we're, we're breaking these things up into two pieces here, diverging and curling parts, now we, it's like we, we have, like as though we didn't have enough fields already, right? And now we're doubling the number of fields because every field is being, de is being decomposed into two pieces. And it's like we're suddenly doubling the number of things we've got to keep track of. But that it'll sort out. You'll see that this will actually help you to see the physical connections that are, that are present. So there's a good reason for doing this. Okay.